when they are magnetically ordered. But the most powerful part of using this technique is using selective use of different iron isotopes. We can turn the signal of an iron oxide off simply by not using iron 57. We use iron 56, we have no sig MOS power signal. However, if we were to make the same oxide out of iron 57, then we get, do get a clear signal. This is an example of hematite. So Dr. Shera's group at the University of Iowa developed a way to take a look at only these iron atoms that react on the surface of these iron minerals. And the trick is to use iron 56 for making the oxide, exposing it to aqueous 57 Fe2. Then when this reaction occurs at the surface, we can filter out these oxide particles, put them in the spectrometer, and see only what uh, see only the atom, iron atoms that have reacted at the surface. The first part of uh, their work was to see what happens without any kind of contaminant, but just absorption of 57 Fe2 on a 56 oxide alone. What they expected was to, well, combine an Fe2 signal plus no six signal from the 56 oxide. You should see some sort of Fe2 signal if Fe2 stays nice and stable on the oxide surface. Instead, what happened was, combining these two, they saw an Fe3 sextet in the form of hematite. They got spectroscopic evidence for a process that wasn't thoroughly considered before. When this Fe2 absorbs onto the iron oxides, it does not stay stable. Instead, it injects its electron to the underlying oxide iron, and on the surface, it gets, ox uh, gets oxidized to Fe3 and continues the underlying structure of the hematite. And they showed this on a number of other iron oxides as well. So here's where I come in. They did this work at one solution condition, but we're interested in environmentally relevant conditions. We wanted to get some spectroscopic evidence for this process over a range of solution pH, for example. And this is an example of uh, someone else studying the uptake of dissolved Fe2 on surfaces as a function of pH in the form of a pH edge. Another way to examine these kinds of surfaces is to vary the aqueous Fe2 concentration and do absorption isotherm, where a few different regimes in the absorption of Fe2 can be observed. So we wanted to get spectroscopic evidence to see if this process occurs over these conditions. We wanted to see if we can get perhaps evidence of different kinds of iron II species on the surface. And we also wanted to see if we can verify or get uh, some more evidence for the different kinds of absorption regimes that it can occur in an isotherm. So I made an Fe2 sorption isotherm, simply mixing 56 <coughs> hematite and aqueous 57 Fe2. And the points here in red are the isotherm points at one constant pH of 7.2. All along this isotherm, we removed the solids, put them in the spectrometer, and got our patterns. Here, for all points along the isotherm, we see these six peaks, which are indicative of hematite. This means that the Fe2 that absorbed on hematite got oxidized and then assembled into the hematite structure. But we see another set of features down here at high Fe2 concentrations. We see two more peaks. And these peaks are in the precise location of an Fe2 doublet and very much resemble Fe2 absorbed on a non-conducting substrate, such as aluminum oxide. We take this as the first spectroscopic evidence for a truly absorbed Fe2 species on an iron mineral, which has not been shown before. But back to the isotherm. We found a few other pieces of information from this diagram. One is we notice this bend in the isotherm here, indicating two different kind of sorption regimes based on this macroscopic data. Well, this bend also occurs at the estimated site saturation. This means there are a certain number of reactive sites we expect on these iron oxides. And if one iron atom reacts at one site, then the whole number of um, reactive sites has become saturated. This occurs right at the bend in the isotherm too. As a matter of fact, those Fe2 doublets appeared only in these points beyond the surface site saturation. And we varied even some more conditions here shown in the filled circles and, and um, points. We found that for all conditions, Above site saturation, we see this surface Fe2 species. Below it, we did not see any surface Fe2. We saw only Fe2 being oxidized to Fe3 and forming hematite. Now, this observation is remarkable because it confronts 
some of the traditional concepts of metal cation sorption. The uh, classical interpretation is that Fe2 absorbs on a surface up to about surface site saturation and then forms some sort of surface precipitation, a different kind of uh, metal cation species. But here we see that the Fe2 absorbs and reacts with the oxide surface up until site saturation and beyond that undergoes simple sorption. So we believe that this kind of spectroscopic evidence can explain the two different sorption regimes and sorption models should be revised to account for this electron transfer process. We wanted to take a look at another assumption inherent in a lot of these sorption processes and models. And that is that um, a lot of the traditional models say that there should be an equilibrium process. When a metal cation is driven to a surface and absorbed, it should be in equilibrium, should be able to desorb when this uh, driving force has been removed. So we tested this. We simply made some more data points from our sorption isotherms, one below site saturation and a couple above. And here we filtered the oxide solids, resuspended them in deionized water to remove this driving force of putting Fe2 on the surface. We wanted to see how much Fe2 would desorb. And we found something remarkable as well. Virtually no desorbed for the point below site saturation. For the ones above, enough Fe2 desorbed to bring it down to site saturation. We took most power spectra of these points and saw that there indeed was no Fe2 on the surface here. It's just all hematite. And what this shows to us is that there are these two different sorption regimes have two different properties. For Fe2 that absorbs below site saturation, the Fe2 remain, the electrons remain trapped in the hematite structure. But when Fe2 absorbs above site saturation, it is most likely in equilibrium with the solution and it can readily desorb. So our information here uh, helps us revise some of these models and these are the contributions that it made. Now the, for a traditional cation sorption, uh, it is assumed that one cation absorbs to one site. That very well may happen, but here with iron absorbing on iron oxides, we are creating new Fe3 sites when the Fe2 becomes oxidized. Monolayer coverage or surface site saturation is uh, predicted to occur and here we do, we, we believe we observed it as well, but now we think the surface site saturation has become linked to a certain capacity of oxides to accept electrons. Moreover, this uh, above monolayer, it's assumed that a surface precipitation of a metal hydroxide forms. Here we show that we do see indeed Fe2 sorption without any kind of electron transfer, so there's a limit to this uh, electron transfer process. It is assumed that sorption is reversible for all conditions, but we're showing sorption was reversible only after this electron transfer capacity was satisfied. And just to give you an example of how these new assumptions can be placed into uh, some models, this is one model given uh, by uh, uh, Far uh, Farlade, Zombach, and Morell for uh, surface site uh, absorption. And what we'd like to contribute is that these equilibrium coefficients uh, can be changed. For example, this is, no, uh, this is still an equilibrium coefficient, but these ones are no longer because of this new electron transfer process. So now, since we took a look at Fe2 just absorbing on iron oxide atoms, we wanted to see what happens to this electron when it gets donated into the oxide. We should be able to observe Fe2 inside this hematite if we're reducing it. What we did to test this was we switched the isotopes. Now we're using 57 isotopes for the oxide, 56 for the aqueous Fe2. During this reaction, we filter them, put them in the spectrometer, and we should only see the signal coming from the oxide itself and not the reacted atoms on the surface. What we expected to see was nothing from the 56 atoms, 57 hematite already there, and then perhaps some sort of Fe2 signal. Instead, we did not. We observed something very different. We saw two Fe3 signals for hematite. The short story is these injected electrons disturbed the magnetic ordering of the hematite and hematite was found to be a simultaneous coexistence of two magnetic domains. These magnetic domains are usually separated by temperature. This weakly ferromagnetic one at room temperature, at colder temperatures anti-ferromagnetic. But the fact that we see these two here is an indication that the electronic disturbance that we gave the hematite has affected the magnetic order. And when we dug into the literature, we found that this has been discussed before. It's been predicted by computational chemists that injected electrons into hematite are rapidly hop 
among iron atoms. And we are getting spectroscopic evidence for what the computational chemists had predicted to occur. Oh, well, this also, this uh, piece of information here is also very helpful in our understanding of iron oxides as environmental semiconductors. Iron oxides cannot be regarded as just static entities, but uh, rather capable of transferring electrons and participating in a lot of redox processes. So now we're coming to a point where we can add a contaminant. We have a little better understanding of the reactions between dissolved Fe2 and the iron 3 surfaces. So here we wanted to see a few questions about what happens to Fe2 when a contaminant is introduced and the contaminant reduction process occurs. We know Fe2 can absorb onto the surface of the iron minerals. The electron can be transferred to the oxide itself. And then somehow the contaminant, either by the surface or by another part, will accept this electron. We wanted to examine what happens to this 57 Fe2 as it gets oxidized to Fe3. Does this Fe3 continue the underlying hematite substrate or does it form completely new minerals? And we conducted these experiments with contaminants Fe2 and hematite as described and we examined these processes here. We use three different kinds of hematite substrates, three different morphologies, rhombohedra, hexagonal plates, and needles in order to vary the available surface area and the number of reactive surface sites. We exposed it to aqueous 57 Fe2 and our contaminant. The, the reaction occurred and F 57 Fe2 was deposited on the surface. The Mossbauer spectra showed the formation of two phases, hematite in these two sextets and a large signal from gertite. This is another phase forming. We were able to confirm the spe these species within, within X-ray diffraction patterns and we were able to see a change in these surfaces from the smooth rhombohedra to something more, more uh, fuzzy. On the 56 hematite hexagons, we also saw the formation of gertite as well as addition formation of hematite. And the surface was roughened also with these kind of needle-like particles which are indicative of gertite. Within the hematite needles as well, we saw gertite formation as well, but at a much less uh, proportion. So we were able to observe two forms of 57-Fe3 forming. It does continue the underlying hematite substrate, and it does form a secondary iron precipitate, but this raised a few more questions. Why did this gertite form in different proportions? Is there any kind of underlying um, scientific piece of information that is governing the abundance of gertite or, the, or why we get gertite instead of others? In order to answer this question, we varied the amount of Fe2 oxidized on the surface of this 56 hematite, here in this case rhombohedra. We varied the solution conditions, we varied the amount of contaminant, and we deposited a whole range of Fe3 on the surface. What we found was once gertite nucleates under a low amount of Fe2 being oxidized, it's the primary species formed. And moreover, for all of these conditions studied, it forms in this proportion, about 85% of the Fe3 that formed, formed as gertite, 14% as hematite, and the remaining as lipidocrosite. So this graph can be considered as a apparent stoichiometry for this kind of reaction, where the distribution of Fe3 phases occurs in these values. So this is for the hematite rhombohedra, and we should be able to see this for the other hematites, and we do. We observed about 85% of the Fe3 forming as gertite on the rhombohedra, about 25% of the gertite forming on the needles, and about 95% forming on the hematite hexagons. So the underlying oxide substrate can dictate the proportion of these new Fe3 phases. In order to answer why, we tried to compare these numbers to certain descriptors of the system. And we found that the best descriptor was the number of surface sites. In this graph here, we found a strong correlation with the abundance of gertite formed and the number of reactive surface sites available. At low number of surface site, we see a high likelihood of Fe3 being governed into a new iron phase and less as hematite, whereas as much more um, uh, reactive surface sites are present, here we can see that hematite has a much greater chance of continuing its growth instead of a secondary crystal growth of gertite forming. We can take the intercepts of these graphs as well, intercepts where gertite hits the x-axis 
this gives us some more information as well. At this point, it's the amount of Fe2 that had been reacted. If we convert that to the number of monolayers or a number of times surface saturation was reached, for these three oxides, we see they coincide. Below it, we see only hematite growth. Above it, we see hematite growth and gertite growth. And what this means is that there seems to be a capacity for oxides to continue growing as their underlying oxide substrate, beyond which it becomes more chemically or thermodynamically favorable to grow a secondary crystal. So after taking a look at these different kinds of hematites, we found that the number of surface sites can strongly govern not only the sorption process, but also the oxidation and abundance of Fe3 forming different minerals. This is just for hematite though. Mm. There are a lot of other different kind of iron oxides which react differently with con contaminants in the ground and we wanted to take a look at these substrates. So on our list we included magnetite, maghemite, and non-iron oxide, aluminum oxide, strictly oxygen without any kind of mineral substrate, and Fe2 oxidizing bacteria which can acquire F uh, electrons from Fe2 and precipitate new Fe3 phases. We wanted to examine the iron oxides formed and see how they compare to this gertite growth on hematite. And we found something very different for other oxides. We found that lipidocrosite does, I'm sorry, magnetite does not grow lipidoc um, gertite so as hematite does. Instead, we found the formation of hematite, which assumed a, uh, a needle type morphology emanating from a common center, something very different from what was observed on hematite. With maghemite, we also saw the formation of these lipidocrosite spikes and not gertite. On alpha aluminum oxide, however, when we exposed it to a contaminant, nitrobenzene, and aqueous Fe2, we saw the color change and we saw the formation of a gertite species over time. As a matter of fact, the gertite species accelerated this reaction here, which goes to show that it's uh, very important to have iron oxides or forms of iron present to facilitate these uh, contaminant transformation, whereas aluminum compounds, they're not as well. These are some FCM images of these gertite needles that were found to cover these surfaces as well. Now we can compare the formation of gertite and lipidocrosite on these mineral surfaces to a reference system of oxidation of Fe2 by oxygen alone. We can take a solution of Fe2, open it up here into the room, and within a matter of minutes, it could turn orange, forming this kind of uh, iron oxide particles here. We found it was pure lipidocrosite. No indication of any kind of gertite. So we find that these minerals have different abilities to direct different kinds of iron oxides. Gertite growing on the alpha aluminum oxide and on hematite. We wanted to try to explain why, so we went into the literature and we also took our SEM images and notices, noticed that these gertite rods <coughs> growing here seem to be in sometimes in a preferred orientation, sometimes at 60 degrees to one another, and others have observed the growth of gertite at 60 degrees from one another on hematite. And they explained it because the oxygen packing arrays of gertite can line up with those of hematite. So under these contaminant reduction processes, we've learned that these iron oxides can template certain kind of phases. And I'll take a pause here for in this part of the talk to summarize these implications. Our iron mass power spectroscopy method provides some insights. One was that the repeated sorption and oxidation of this Fe2 does res can resor uh, resort into some sort of new iron phases forming. And it's a surface property, such as the number of available surface sites, likely governs the onset of the abundance of these phases. Hematite as well as some aluminum oxides may be able to template and direct the formation of a gertite phase. And we would like to use this information to improve reaction models on mineral surfaces. For example, we need to account for the formation of these new iron phases and the transformation from one surface to another for the reactive surface. And we'd also like to, uh, we also need to understand how different iron three phases can impact the reduction rate of contaminants. Others have done many experiments comparing reaction rates of different iron minerals with different contaminants and found different orders of magnitude for contaminant reduction rates. So it certainly is important what kind of iron oxides are available in subsurface environments. For the last part of this talk, I'll just mention our attempt to describe the iron three products formed not by oxidation of Fe2 by contaminants, but instead by bacteria.
we wanted, our motivation was to take a look in for a better characterization of these iron three particles that form. In nature, these particles are often quite amorphous and very difficult to characterize. So we wanted to use very controlled laboratory conditions to characterize these and see what kind of phases form. We used a bacterium of the Acetovorex species, put it in fairly simple solution conditions and let it oxidize Fe2 and formed Fe3. The Fe3 formed a, a kind of an orange particle. We took most power spectra and we found that it's mostly lipidochrosite with a trace of gertite. So here we're still seeing these formations of lipidochrosite versus gertite. But it's interesting to see the rather large abundance of lipidochrosite, just as we would see in Fe2 oxidation by molecular oxygen alone. It goes to show that there very well may not be a kind of biotic effect that bacteria may exert on the oxidation of Fe2. So it's nice to see very crystalline minerals formed under controlled laboratory conditions, but in nature it's often not the case. So we wanted to set out to see, well, if bacteria have a capacity of forming these crystalline iron oxides, what environmental geochemical solution conditions promote instead the formation of more amorphous or disordered Fe3, or sometimes gertite, instead of this lipidochrosite during microbial Fe2 oxidation. After all, we don't quite see lipidochrosite in nature very well. So we varied some geochemical solution conditions. We found that higher pH promotes the formation of gertite over lipidochrosite. We also found that carbonate species promote gertite, although to a lesser extent than lipidochrosite. And both of uh, uh, slightly higher pH conditions or uh, higher carbonate conditions are, can be quite common in the environment in both freshwater and marine water systems. Phosphate species end up completely disordering and making very difficult to identify the iron three species that form. I'm not including a model in these MOS power spectra because we couldn't quite fit one. The X-ray diffraction patterns also show a degree of disorder and amorphous once some phosphate has been present. And it's been shown that, or it's been suggested that phosphate will, uh, will absorb onto any kind of small nucleated Fe3 and present, prevent it from forming any kind of crystalline structure. And lastly, we use dissolved Humic acids. Humic acids are uh, dissolved organic carbon within uh, natural waters. They, it's what gives a tint of brown or some color to water, uh, such as shown here. And when we exposed these uh, humic acids to the bacteria as they oxidized Fe2, we did find that it directed gertite formation over lipidochrosite as well. But at higher concentrations, we found no mineral identification was possible. So it's another candidate for explaining why so many um, iron oxides formed under biological activity in the environment are rather disordered and amorphous. Overall, we learned a few things from these studies about what would control the oxidation of Fe2 in the minerals formed. For example, when <coughs> mineral surfaces are present, the identity of the mineral surface formed after Fe2 oxidation is highly dependent on the mineral substrate itself, where sometimes hematite would direct gertite and uh, other minerals can direct another phase. But for the oxidation by bacteria, the Fe3 minerals formed are strongly governed by the geochemical solution conditions, such as the abundance of dissolved phases of phosphate organic compounds as well. Overall, we would like to promote reactive Fe2 species within groundwater contaminant plumes. Some peo people have tried this by stimulating native bacteria to reduce Fe2, form more reactive species. Others have injected iron directly into groundwater plumes. And it's still a challenge to try to create very favorable in situ conditions to rapidly transform these contaminants in order to improve groundwater quality. And I'd like to thank everybody who has helped me in this kind of work. And I'd like to field any questions that you have at this time. Thank you. about the, um, <coughs> the nature of the, the binding sites that the iron uh, absorbs to. I, I, I mean, I, I sort of get this impression that there's this rather, there's this, there's this distribution of sites that are all rather <coughs> uniform in their, in their binding characteristics, and then they become saturated and you have a very different behavior. But um, I wonder if within that, within the sites that are below the saturation concentration, there isn't some heterogeneity there. And in particular, if you were to look at the, at the distribution coefficients, not just for the iron two, but for the corresponding iron three, you might get some insight that might 
I, I'm just wondering if there mm -hmm. this could be a, like a linear free energy relationship. You know, if, Certainly. if the mining site gives rise to a very stable iron mm -hmm. three coordination environment, it might be more prone to donating electron to the mineral than than otherwise. Precisely. It's quite remarkable that our information indicates, or rather there's this coincidence of surface site saturation and the stopping of this uh, electron transfer process. It may be a coincidence, but uh, so we're not exactly sure. What we do need is to consider a higher resolution of information, such as accounting for different reactive sites on minerals, which has, of course, been talked about for a very long time. Right now, it just seems to, the evidence seems to suggest that there may be some sort of homogeneous covering, but we do know that iron oxides have a very heterogeneous surface. And I would expect with an additional tool or approach, we could reveal the role of individual surface sites in uh, unique surface sites, rather, instead of just assuming that they all react the same. Uh, I could ask one. Uh, you showed the picture of the electron bouncing around inside the lattice. Mm -hmm. um, do you have an idea of, how, of what is the, function, the uh, point at which that electron gets to the uh, organic substrate? That's really interesting. I mean, some of these reactions with organic contaminants are so rapid they can occur within just minutes. And uh, so we think this electron transfer process could be very, very fast. Although it all depends on what kind of contaminant. Sometimes the transfer process is very slow in the order of days or hours. Yeah. When you analyze these samples and do the spectroscopy, I assume you have to keep the surface wet, or, or uh, do you do this in a solution through the wall of some container, or how do you actually uh, do the experimental? We filter the solids as a moist paste and then place them between two layers of oxygen and permeable tape, and permeable tape called Kapton tape. And then we immediately freeze it in the spectrometer under a helium atmosphere, which prevent any kind of oxygen contamina um, contamination or oxidation later. Yeah, if we were to dry the oxide surfaces, then we would be in an entirely different environment, and we certainly don't want to do that. Well, the most reactive form of iron for nitrobenzene that I would think of would be zero valent iron and not the iron oxide. But if I were to choose an iron oxide, I would choose one that reacts uh, the quickest with nitrobenzene. And a lot of the, well, with nitrobenzene, it actually reacts very fast with a lot of these oxides. And there may be less selectivity in that regard. But I would choose something that is easy to synthesize, something that's easily uh, reducible and reacts with sorbed Fe2, such as uh, magnetite, something that can disperse well enough. Uh, there is a lot of these conditions, a lot of these uh, questions that we would have to be addressed. But, um, Certainly does. Zero valent iron or iron metal can be used to transform this contaminant as well as many others and it has been used in uh, injection experiments into the ground. And the zero valent iron surface can oxidize to uh, and form oxides in the coating many a times, which is magnetite. And it still is a reactive surface in that case as well. Um, you it showed in some experiments how the difference in water quality, pH, and such can influence the characteristic of the minerals produced. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to correlate that to what is seen in the natural environment? You know, like below, below an acid swamp, where we get various different kinds of iron minerals and then some other places? I've been able to see some loose parallels based on what I've, wor what I've worked on and what is presented in the literature. For one, um, I've noticed in the literature if there are high dissolved carbonate systems, there is a predominance of gertite, and I've shown that bicarbonate can promote gertite species. Under um, other conditions where phosphate is present, the authors report a very disordered phase forming, and I've shown that just a little bit of amount of phosphate can form that as well. 
But in a lot of settings, such as in marine environments or some freshwater sediments, a lot of times these minerals are very difficult to characterize. They're just too small and too disordered for proper characterization. And I think it's because of these organic and inorganic compounds that are absorbing onto newly, freshly nucleated Fe3 particles, as others have discussed before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, now, if, if you have characterized everything very well and so forth, so you have very good knowledge about what is happening in here. So instead of actually creating, you know, instead of injecting that, it would be possible based on the, the geochemical characteristic of, of the soil, you can uh, produce the right nanoparticles, as you mentioned, which is in situ, so for, for our transformation of organic We would certainly like to do that, and some people have examined this process of biostimulation, trying to provide nutrients and carbon sources to native microbes, which can then transform and reduce these iron oxides and liberate Fe2. And uh, we just don't know too much information yet under the subsurface where we can't exactly see. We don't know exactly what kind of iron oxides have been formed in these uh, scenarios. All we can really do is monitor the contaminant concentration and see it's decreasing. Uh, but I would love to get some iron 57 into the ground and just let it sit there in situ for some time and then take it out and measure it on the most power. Uh, but Perhaps that's an experiment for a future time. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.